All right, chapter 15. This chapter is all about the evolution of Darwin's theory, and it's, it's one of those really controversial issues uh, in biology, but it's one of the most important discoveries in the field of biology because it really kind of opened up the floodgates to progress and, uh, and to a new way of thinking and, and a new way of looking at the world. And so this lecture is going to be all about how Darwin collected the evidence, what the evidence was, what the, the theory is based on, and the contributors or the people that worked closely with Darwin, or at least in Darwin's time, um, and helped kind of advance this theory uh, to one that, that obviously Darwin is credited for. So evolution, um, when, when kind of broken down, is, is all about, and I know you've heard this phrase before, but it's all about this idea of descent with modification, meaning organisms are going to pass on their traits, and those traits are going to change gradually or modify gradually over time. And so as organisms produce offspring, they'll pass their traits onto that offspring uh, or to those offspring, and those traits will uh, be passed on, and eventually um, the population as a whole will, will change. Evolution can be viewed as both a pattern and a process, meaning that it very much is a process, and evolution is changing the way that organisms or species interact with their environment um, over time. And so it's, 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 it's really important for you to understand this concept, that individuals, individual organisms, never evolve because you were born as a human, you will die as a human, you will not change in your lifetime to anything else. Individuals do not evolve, populations evolve, but it takes large periods of time. If you're talking about uh, primates or, or other organisms like ourselves, mammals. If you're talking about bacteria who double in population every 20 minutes or who reproduce every 20 minutes, then that evolution can obviously take a lot less time meaning bacteria populations and virus populations uh, will evolve very rapidly. And we'll watch the lecture, we'll watch videos, and we've already seen some, that, that showcase some of the, uh, the evolution times in, in different populations. Okay, so let's talk about early Darwin. Um, he obviously traveled around the world, uh, or at least left Great Britain, and I included this map down here. He left Great Britain, followed the arrows, sailed around the south edge of South America, making multiple stops, um, obviously looking at the coast of South America, finally stopping in the Galapagos. Galapagos Islands are where most of his research took place. It's where his laboratory of sorts away from Great Britain was, and it's, it's really the source of the inspiration for the development of this theory. Um, the Galapagos Islands are still, to this day, one of the most influential um, group of islands that are researched uh, in this area of, of evolution. Um, one reason is because they're relatively new. They are by far um, much more uh, current or much more um, much younger than the mainland of South America because they are formed by, by volcanoes and so they are not as old and so the species on them are not as old. Um, but he sailed on the Beagle, that was his ship, in 1831. It took him about six years to get from Great Britain down around the coast of South America to the Galapagos Islands, over to Australia, around the south tip of Africa, hitting Brazil one more time before returning back to Europe. Um, and so while he was sailing, he collected evidence at every stop. And there's a map in, in your book, page 369, that looks very similar to this one, um, that will help you track that, that, that map or trap that, track that route. But his observations led to patterns of diversity. And you will see in videos that um, finches, first of all, and tortoises really caught his attention. And he noticed that on different islands, most of which had very similar habitats, there were obviously differences among the, the populations of organisms there, and, uh, and most notably in the finches. He saw finches that had big beaks, and he, had, he saw finches that had small beaks, and he uh, noticed finches that were larger in body size and smaller in body size, and he wondered why. Why would God... Uh, who at the time was obviously thought of as being the creator of all life on earth, why would God produce uh, various organisms 
that look different and place them on virtually identical islands. Uh, to him, that, that was a question that, that he wanted to further kind of, you know, analyze and study. He obviously had questions that arose about the distribution of organs. Why, like I said, would different birds be put on virtually similar islands? Um, it just didn't make sense to him, okay? And why did continents with similar habitats have different species? Okay, those are of fantastic questions, obviously ones that he uh, obviously worked to, to research and try to answer. So here is the chain of Galapagos Islands. You can see there are several islands. Some of them are larger than others, but they're quite a ways away. You can see the scale here. Um, you know, most of them are several miles or several kilometers away. And so once the organisms are um, established on an island, a lot of times they stay on that specific island and they don't travel much. Um, and so it really geographically isolates those populations to that particular area. Uh, and, uh, and all those species have to kind of carve out their own niche within those, or, or with, within those populations um, on those islands. Okay, um, islands were very close together, but mm, you know some of them were similar. Some of them had different climates. Some of them are higher in altitude than others. Some are very much coastal, uh, right at sea level. Some have uh, very hot climates. Some have very cool climates. Some are uh, more moist than others. Some are more desert-like. Um, some have a lot of vegetation. Some have very little vegetation. And while he was there. Not only did the finches catch his attention, but tortoises caught his attention too. Okay, finches and tortoises. So these are a couple of the Galapagos tortoises. Notice that they look very dim different, and even from the picture, you can you can discern that not only do they look different, but they have very different habitats. This tortoise is obviously in very short grass. This tortoise is in very tall grass. This tortoise probably couldn't see very well if it was in taller grass like this, and this tortoise obviously would stick out more than it already does in very short grass like this. Um, why are these tortoises shaped the way they are? Well, it probably has something to do with the habitat that they live in. This tortoise is very low to the ground, and it probably can get by being very low to the ground because it's in a very flat, um, very lush habitat. This one is more of an off-roader, meaning he's higher off the ground, has a higher center of gravity, and has longer legs because this ground is probably a little more uneven more rocky, higher grass. He's got to be able to raise his head up and see over the tall grass. He has a modified shell that lets him raise his head up, whereas this one doesn't. Um, so they have several uh, behavioral and several structural advantages for their particular environment. That was a mystery to him. Why do these turtles on you know similar islands, but different habitats, have different structural adaptations? Here's a picture of some of the Galapagos type islands or environments. So you have some were very hot, dry, rocky, sandy, um, arid, and some are very lush, tropical, um, vegeta you know, vegetative type islands. And so what traits do you think an animal might need to survive on hot, dry, rocky islands? This type of environment is very harsh to live in, and so the organisms that live there have to have... Uh, maybe water filtration adaptations and be able to conserve water, whereas water is readily available here, and so they probably don't need to have as much water uh, conservation type traits. Finches. Okay, so as he journeyed home, and as you recall from the, the video we watched, he looked at the uh, the island's finch species, and he observed quite a few different characteristics. Some of them have beaks like that. It was more of a cactus eater type bird. A lot of them had needle-like beaks like this one, which were insect eaters, and then some that eat seeds and hard nuts have a bigger beak. Think of beaks on birds as tools, and you have to have the right tool for the right job. And so the beak not only is a is an adaptation that has evolved over time or has changed over time, but it is a specialized tool used for a particular job. Um, one that he obviously looked at and wanted to study further. He quickly came up with a hypothesis and he basically stated that separate species would have originated from a single South American ancestor after becoming isolated. 
Um, and we now know, based on DNA evidence, that all of the species of finches on the Galapagos Islands, though very varied, are more closely related to each other than they are of the common ancestor or the common ground finch of South America. It's believed that the South American ancestor is the common ancestor among all species on the Galapagos, but the Galapagos Islands have uh, very little DNA difference, even though they look different. While he was on his trip, he found a lot of fossils. Uh, fossils provide a great tool or a great piece of evidence when we're talking about evolution because it basically gives you a picture of what the organisms look like. And if you compare organisms uh, based on their structural, uh, their fossil structure, and based on animals that are alive today, you can discern that those organisms had to change, um, especially if it's, an, if it's an extinct species, because you know that that organism was once alive and is obviously not alive now. So he found species like this one that resemble modern-day animals, and uh, he found a, a species that resemble a modern-day armadillo, um, we don't know if or how closely they are related because we don't have DNA evidence of this guy, but we do know that based on structural components, they do resemble each other, and there are a lot of species in the fossil record that, that, that fit that same bill. So, evolution timeline. Here is the, uh, the traveling, okay, 1831 to 1836. That's when he traveled on the Beagle. He wrote his essay, as the video we watched uh, demonstrated, several years after he arrived uh, because he was basically collecting evidence and analyzing the evidence in this 10-year this gap. He then published, finally, later, The Origin of Species towards the end of his career and then ultimately died in, like, 1872, so right in here. Um, but notice that there are people like Hutton, Maltus, Lamarck, Cuvier. All these people played instrumental roles in the development of Darwin's theory. A lot of people give the credit of evolution to Darwin, but these people actually, and notice by this timeline, proposed things before Darwin, um, but didn't have the full kind of picture of what evolution really was. And so Darwin came along asked all these really good questions related to all the evidence that he found, used literature proposed by Lamarck, Maltus, Hutton, Cuvier, uh, to ultimately strengthen his, uh, his views of evolution and uh, eventually his, his actual theory. Uh, and it's one that is still accepted today. So let's talk a little bit about these ancient ideas, um, specifically starting with Hutton. So Hutton published in 1795, which is obviously before Darwin's time, his hypothesis that geologic forces shape the earth. And we all know, I mean, it seems like a no-brainer today, or it seems like a pretty elementary thought today, that there are geological forces that are shaping the earth. But in 1795, uh, which was around the time when the earth was thought to have been flat, which we also know as being a very elementary uh, type idea, it is obviously not flat, um, at the time, they thought that the earth was basically produced by God or by acts of, of religion or whatever uh, the case might be, but they didn't know about these things like earthquakes or um, landslides or mudslides or ice ages or, um, or global warming or anything, any of these geological forces. Um, layers of rock form slowly and may be moved up by subsurface forces, again, earthquakes, erosion, stuff like that. Other layers are buried in sediment and are, um, are moved to deeper type, you know, bodies of lakes and stuff like that. Earth is shaped by rain, wind, heat, and cold, which basically means or is a very elementary way of saying erosion, ice age, uh, global warming, stuff like that can obviously shape the earth, and we know that to be true. And... Those processes operate very slowly, and so the Earth has to be more than a few thousand years old. Previously, before Hutton had proposed these things, they thought that the Earth was very new and the, the Earth was very young, um, which is obviously not the case. Okay, So he proposed that the Earth has to be a lot older than previously thought. And in fact, it's not 
it's not a few thousand years old, it's probably more like a few billion years old. Lyle, a few years later, Lyle came along and actually wrote a book that, that kind of took Hutton's principles a little step further. And he was the one that actually identified specific geological forces like volcanoes, erosion, um, landslides, earthquakes, were the causes of the earth changing over time. And he basically said that um, Hutton was right. The earth must be a lot older than we think because these things, while can change the earth in, uh, at least on a small scale pretty quickly, these things have to add uh, or these things have to happen over and over and over and over again before the earth changes big enough in order to influence uh, species to change over time. And so Darwin basically said if the earth has been proven to change over time, then life has to change with it. Because if the earth is changing and life doesn't change, the life that was created for the current world is not going to be relevant after the earth changes. So if the earth can change, so does life. Life has to change with a changing world. It makes sense. This must take a long, long time to change life, so the earth must be very, very old. These things don't change overnight. The earth changes very slowly. The, the life on earth changes very slowly as well. Lamarck, he was the closest to what Darwin was trying to propose, but he had several flaws in his hypothesis. He was the first to suggest that living things change over time, but all species descend from other species, but he had this idea, which was wrong, okay? Selective use or disuse of organs caused organisms to acquire or lose traits over their lifetime, which are then passed down to offspring, thus changing the species. This part of his hypothesis was the most incorrect of everything he proposed because we know that acquired traits cannot be passed on to offspring. An example of that would be if you dyed your hair red, that is an acquired trait. You now have red hair. You, according to him, would then pass on red hair to your offspring because, as he proposed, acquired traits are passed down. We know that not to be the case. Another thing, if you tattooed yourself, that is an acquired trait, you would then pass a tattoo down to your offspring. If you pierced your ears, that is an acquired trait, you would pass that down to your offspring. If you cut your arm off, either on purpose or by accident, you would pass an armless trait onto your offspring. Good thing for us is that acquired traits are not passed on and selective use or disuse of organs is not passed on as well. Okay, selective use or disuse is basically a fancy way of saying use it or lose it. He proposed that if an organism failed to use a specific structure in their lifetime, they would lose it over time. Uh, again, that is not the case. So, his ideas, tendency towards perfection. Again, he thought that animals change over time and become more perfect as they change. That is kind of right, right? Organisms want to become more fit in their environment, so they change to become ultimately more perfect in their environment. Use and disuse, wrong. That is not correct. Inheritance of acquired traits, that is wrong. We don't pass on acquired traits. And evaluating Lamarck's hypothesis would show you that two out of the three things are absolutely wrong. One of them is, is kind of right, meaning organisms really are in pursuit of perfection but don't ever really become perfect because perfect is kind of a subjective term. So let's talk a little bit about what these items mean in more detail. So if we look at tendency to per towards perfection, um, that basically, like I said before, is proposing an idea that all organisms have an innate tendency towards complexity and perfection, like ancestors of birds acquired an urge to fly, so they repeatedly tried until their wings became suited for flight. Um, you can't become perfect or you can't acquire these traits in real time or within your lifetime. Okay, use and disuse. If a winged animal did not use its wings, the wings would decrease in size over generations and finally disappear. Um, again, not necessarily the case. Inheritance of acquired traits. If you spent your lifetime lifting weights to build muscles, your children would inherit big muscles too. That is not the case. Okay, while there is a genetic component to muscular size, we cannot inherit acquired traits. Okay. 
So if we look at a little graph of, or a little uh, a picture of what Lamarck hypothesized, that there could be a male crab with very small claws that who tried over and over and over could never get the females, right? Never get, get the ladies because he had really small claws. All he had to do, according to Lamarck, was continually use this little left claw. And if he used it over and over and over and over and over and over and over, eventually it will grow in size and he will then get the ladies. And because he now has a large claw, they will breed with him and he produces offspring with big claws. That is not the case. It doesn't work like that. Sorry. And the last person to talk about is Maltus. Uh, Thomas Maltus was a guy that was more kind of a, a statistician and uh, and more involved with like human population growth. And he researched pieces of uh, evidence like forces, war, famine, disease, uh, um, and their effect on population growth. All of these things, like war, famine, disease, all check populations um, and will impact the way populations grow over time. Okay, Darwin realized that Malta's position to humans also applied to plants and animals because if there were factors that impact population growth in humans, there has to be factors that impact population growth in plants and animals. We're all alive. We all are subjected to the same environmental pressures and, uh, and it's basically a, uh, an idea that, that shaped the way Darwin looked at natural selection or looked at uh, what would eventually become this idea of natural selection. Animals and plants produce more offspring than the environment could possibly support. That is important because you want to obviously produce more than the environment support can support so that the strongest are the ones that survive, the weakest are the ones that die out, the weakest don't pass on their traits to offspring, the strongest do pass on their traits to offspring, and your population as a whole can change over time to become uh, better suited to that particular environment and uh, become better species or that, that population becomes a better species. What factors determine which offspring survive or not? Bunch of, you know, whatever makes that, that species more fit for that environment are factors that are going to be passed on. Factors that make an offspring less successful or a species less successful are not going to be passed on. Okay, so in reassessing his observations, Darwin perceived adaptation to the environment and the origin of new species as closely related processes. Okay, he looked at all these people and all their work and looked at the evidence that he collected and made observations and, um, and basically came up with this idea of natural selection. Natural selection by definition, is the process in which individuals with favorable inherited traits are more likely to survive and reproduce because they're more, or they make the species or the individual more fit in their environment uh, and therefore better able to survive. And so as Darwin presents his case to the people of his time in the publicized version of The Origin of Species, which is a book that he wrote, published in 1859, he suggested that changes to species is through natural selection, meaning organisms change over time based on inherited characteristics. Um, inherited variation and artificial selection are key to the evolution of species. Members of each species vary from each other in important ways. Darwin argued that variation mattered and was important to the species. This was counter to thoughts uh, that were currently um, in the scientific community. Variation up to this point was thought to be unimportant and breeders selected the traits and tried to breed desirable traits into plants and animals and that's the way dogs came to be about okay every single one of the domesticated dog breeds are the direct descendant uh, of the wolf okay they all have wolf DNA they're all descended from the wolf but they are the result of a term called artificial selection meaning humans selected the traits and bred those traits into the animals and plants for improvement. And so if people, humans, wanted the smartest dog, they would breed the smartest wolves together over and over and over and over and over and over the course of many generations produced the more intelligent dog breeds. If they wanted a smaller dog, they would breed the smallest wolves back to the smallest wolves. And over the course of only breeding small wolves to small wolves, they produced really small dog breeds like the Chihuahua. If they wanted a really long dog, like 
the weenie or the chawini. They would take the longest wolves and they would breed those dogs together and they would consistently breed just the longest dogs together and you get the, the wiener dog. Okay, that is artificial selection. Some of the food items that we have today even, like cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, kohlrabi, are all bred from the wild mustard plant, meaning all of them, all these food items, come from this plant. But humans have selectively or artificially selected uh, what part of the plant they wanted to enlarge. Brussels sprouts are selected for auxiliary buds, okay? So we, we purposely bred the plants with the biggest auxiliary bugs, um, and we produced Brussels sprouts. We only bred the biggest apical tips uh, together, and we got cabbage. We only bred the largest flowers and stems, and we got broccoli and kohlrabi. We selected for the biggest leaves, and you get things like kale. Okay, humans have created those. These are species of plants that have been, been created by humans from the uh, common ancestor, which is the wild mustard. Okay, a few observations Darwin made is that members of a population often vary in their inherited traits. You can see that here. These are all ladybugs, but you'll notice that every ladybug looks different, and you really don't notice ladybugs looking different until you get a bunch of them at the same time. Okay, so every single species on the planet has variation much like humans. We know that humans obviously look different um, and have a lot of variation, but so do other organisms. All species can produce more offspring than the environment can support, and many of these offspring fail to survive and reproduce, but the more variety and the more potential offspring you produce, the better your chances of survival for a particular environment. Uh, and so that's a really good, it's a really good thing in terms of, of sexual reproduction and, um, and survivability of a species. So when you put those observations together, you make a couple inferences. And inference one is individuals who inherited traits give them a higher probability of surviving and reproducing in a given environment tend to leave more offspring than other individuals. And so if the tallest giraffes who can reach the most food produce the most offspring because they're the most successful, then over time, your giraffes will get taller and taller and taller. Inference number two, this unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce will lead to the accumulation of favorable traits in the population over generations. And the panda bear is a perfect example of acquiring a trait that makes it easier to survive and reproduce and acquire food uh, you know that panda bears eat a lot of bamboo. It's actually one of the main diets or main food items in their diet. And um, they have actually acquired this kind of bone appendage, which is not a thumb, but they have their five digits here, but they have this kind of bony outgrowth, which is in the place of a thumb, which allows them to grab a hold of a piece of bamboo um, and kind of pinch it with their digits against that bone and it makes it easier to eat and those organisms that have the largest bone obviously be you know makes it, it's the easiest to eat and so they probably survive the best and reproduce and so that bony appendage has been getting bigger over time so natural selection a summary if we summarize um, what natural selection is individuals with certain heritable characteristics survive and reproduce at a higher rate than other individuals, okay? And you can see all the bird beaks here. There are a bunch of different structures, all having different jobs. Again, you have to have the right tool for the right job. Natural selection increases the adaptation of organisms to their environment over time. That's really important. And if an environment changes over time, natural selection may result in adaptation to these new conditions and may give rise to new species, okay? It's called speciation, uh, and we'll talk more about that. Couple pictures. Here is a praying mantis that has obviously been adapted to the environment it lives in. Here's another one. Again, perfectly adapted for the leaf litter. And another one, perfectly adapted for life on leaves. I think that's where I'll leave it for this one. Uh, catch you next time.